It is good to be here in the house of the Lord on his blessed Sabbath day. Hearing the word, seeing the praise, experiencing the prayer, participating in giving. All of these things bind us closer together as a family of God. God has provided this Sabbath day for us to do just that, that we might be one. The title of today's message is, Jesus Prayed for Me. Jesus Prayed for Me. Let us pray. Loving Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity to experience your love and your word. We ask for an anointing from heaven that this word may be yours and not mine. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If I was to ask each of you right now to say the Lord's Prayer, each one of you would say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, etc., etc., that is not the Lord's Prayer. That is the disciples' prayer that Jesus taught them to pray. Can you say amen? He's, they said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. And that's what he said. So he was giving that to them as their prayer. The true Lord's Prayer. Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ the anointed one, Jesus, the son of God, the son of man, Jesus, the rose of Sharon, lily of the valley, Jesus, the bright and morning star, Jesus prayed prayer in John chapter 17. That is the true Lord's prayer. That prayer was not just a prayer for Jesus himself, but that's how he started. It was not just a prayer for his disciples, for that's how he continued. But it was also a prayer for you. And if you don't want the prayer to be for you, it was a prayer for me. I, you know, there are a lot of people who can pray. I mean, they can put words together. They can make things flow they can make things sound just fantastic and you might be feeling whoa this prayer's got to be getting up into heaven I'm gonna be all right I'm gonna get up out this bed I'm gonna be healed because they said this and they said that and they finished it off in the name of Jesus but the prayer didn't go above the roof and you are still there in your bed. You see, when you want somebody to pray for you, you want to know that that person is connected with God. You don't want to just know that that person can pray like, wow, everybody was amazed by that person's prayer. It is not the power of the person. It is not the eloquence of the person. It is not the way that they can use language that moves the heart of God. What moves God? What moves God is Jesus, his only son. That's what moves God. And when you are connected with Jesus, the only son of God, and when you pray in the name of Jesus, being connected with Jesus by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, you open your mouth to pray. You may not string all kinds of words together and just cause people to flip out with what you say, but if you can move the needle of the heart of God by having Christ inside, all you need to do is like Peter say, Lord, help me. And he will reach his hand down as you are sinking into the depths of life and pull you up and save you. John chapter 17 is the Lord's prayer. Let me give you an introduction. The book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, 
and John are the four Gospels. And they all present Jesus from a different perspective. Matthew presents Jesus as Messiah. Mark presents Jesus as a suffering servant. Luke presents Jesus as a man. But John presents Jesus as God, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, the Godhead, co-equal, co-eternal with the Father and the Spirit, symbolized by an eagle, majesty over the earth. And it starts out speaking about Jesus as God. For what does John 1, 1 say? Like Genesis 1, 1 which says in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, not the heavens and the earth, but the heaven and the earth. Indeed, God did create the heavens. But this Bible that we have is a book about this heaven and this earth. When atmospheric heaven where the birds and planes fly, the heaven where the stars are, that is a different heaven. And the heaven where God is, that's an even different heaven. I want to get past the stars to the heaven where God is. What about you? Amen. So we need to understand what the word has to say. So when we get to the book of John, it starts out by saying, like Genesis 1, it says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And the word was God. Now, people who don't want to believe that, they, they change the Bible. They have new translations, new versions, and there are a number of versions of the Bible that are not versions that God has inspired. They are versions that have been produced by the devil to try to take away the divinity of Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. The Bible, there's a Bible out now called the Queer Bible. We don't want to read that Bible. We want to stay with the Word of God. Can you say amen? The Gospel of John begins with the Word as the Lamb. In chapter 1, chapter 2, he changes water to wine. He cleanses the temple. In chapter 3, he speaks to Nicodemus and says, For God so loved the world. In chapter 4, he's talking to the woman at the well about him being the Messiah. Chapter 5, he is healing a man who was born lame, a miracle on the Sabbath at the feast. He then fed the 5,000 in chapter 6 and 7. He was at the Feast of Tabernacles and ate the woman in adultery. He saved her. Chapter 9, Sabbath miracle of the man born blind. Chapter 10, I am the Son of God. Chapter 11, the resurrection of Lazarus. Chapter 12, triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Chapter 13, the last... of the book of John are all from the last supper to uh, Jesus' resurrection. John spends eight chapters dealing with the divinity of Christ. Chapter 13, as he's dealing with them at the last supper, chapter 14, he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. I go to prepare a place for you. How many of you want Jesus to prepare a place for you up in heaven? Amen. Chapter 15, I am the vine. Ye are the branches. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you will. It will what? Be done unto you. Chapter 16, Jesus says he's going to send the comforter. Now, if Jesus was just some created being, as some, some people believe that Michael the archangel was a created being, he's not. He's the commander-in-chief, captain of the heavenly host. Archangel is not a title, not a description of his nature. And uh, how can this created being, Michael the archangel, if that's all he is, how can he send the Holy Ghost? Huh? He can't. But Jesus says, I will send you another comforter. Chapter 17 is where we'll be residing today. Christ teaching his disciples about his love for them and how he desires that they should be one with one another and with God. Chapter 18, he's in Gethsemane. You see him there praying to his father again, as it were great drops of blood falling from his face. 
Chapter 19 is the crucifixion. Chapter 20, the resurrection. He comes forth from the grave early Sunday morning on the first day of the week, the day after the Sabbath. He rested in creation on the Sabbath, and then as he created again the new humanity in spirit and truth, he rested again on the Sabbath. God... sheep and he repeats it two more times and Peter is getting frustrated but Jesus wants Peter to let him know Peter you have been weak but you can be strong Peter you abandoned me do not abandon my sheep Peter I'm putting you in charge as the leader of the disciples you can carry this burden you have big shoulders as a man of God and you can carry this ministry forward don't let me down, Peter. So Jesus, as he prays for his disciples, in John 17, if you have your Bibles handy, it will not be on the screen. Please pick up your Bibles. How, whatever kind of Bible you have, please bring your hard print page Bible to church with you. Develop a love affair with handling the word of God. Your cell phone and your iPad and your tablet, your your desktop computer, your laptop computer, one of these days, they're going to go dead. Not because you don't have an adapter, but because you will not be able to buy or sell services, goods. You will not be able to buy electricity. You will not be able to buy food and water. But God says your food and your water will be what? He'll be sure. What does God not say? He does not say your electrical power will be sure. So you need to get real with the real printed word of God. In these words, Jesus speaks in John 17, verse 1. Message titled, Jesus prayed for me. Everybody. said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. We talk about intercessory prayer at the time of worship here in the church. And that is indeed what we have. But me interceding for my family as a man of God, me interceding or Elder Reed interceding for the church and Elder Nanji as in prayer for the body of Christ. Uh, that's one thing. But wouldn't you want Jesus to be interceding for you? Wouldn't you want him to be the one to connect with the Father? He doesn't have to say like I have to say. He doesn't have to say to his Father, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray. He don't have to say that. I do. You do. And if you don't, you don't have any power in your prayer. Don't be afraid when you're in a group of people. If you get to be on a TV show as an actor or an actress, and they say, we want you to pray a prayer, but you can't pray it in the name of Jesus, don't be afraid to stand on principle. How many of you are aware that there's a young lady just recently, I don't know if she was an actress or a musician, who said that God is being viewed as an enemy in the industry. I think it may have been music. And that... She opted to stand on the side of God rather than be railroaded through the entertainment industry. Have you heard of this recently? Someone showed it to me. We need to be able to say in the name. relationship with God I don't have to close my eyes when I pray Jesus was so connected to his father when he lifted up his eyes he of course was outside 
He wasn't in a building looking up at the roof that the carpenters didn't really put together right to distract his eyes. He was in heaven. I mean, he was, I'm sorry, he was outside uh, and praying with his disciples. I imagine he says, his scripture says he looked up to what? Heaven. So he was outside. Or he was, yes, he was look, He was outside. And he says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. How did Jesus glorify his father? After he prayed in verses 1 through 5 for himself, verses 6 through 19 for his disciples, and verses 20 to 26 for all believers, Jesus went to Gethsemane. In Gethsemane, he really agonized with the Father and got the strength that he needed to be able to endure the cross, despise the shame, and look beyond the cross at your smiling face on the sea of glass. That's what got Jesus through Gethsemane and the cross. Looking at you and me with golden crowns, golden slippers, long white robe, with wings and harps playing. Can you imagine what was going on in the mind of Jesus? We look forward to the concert coming up in two If I be what? Lifted up, I will do what? Draw all men unto me. So he glorified his father in the crucifixion. He glorified his father in his interment. Kind of an interment. He wasn't put in the ground, but he was put in a cave, as it were. And uh, he had told his disciple, I will be killed. But he also said something else, that he would do what again? I would rise again. So he glorified his father in his three-day passion of crucifixion, entombment, and resurrection. And now he's asking that his father would give him the strength to do that. That's what Jesus was talking about when he said, glorify me and I will glorify you. Verse 2. As thou hast given me power over all flesh, that I should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given me. Who gives us eternal life? Jesus gives us eternal life. It is through his sacrifice as the Son of God that he is able to give eternal life to as many as his Father gives to him. You see, if you want eternal life, the Father has to go to the Father and to see, having interceded for us all this time, he then has to go to the Father and receive from the Father those that the Father has judged as righteous. Yes, we will sit before the judgment seat of Christ but it is the judgment seat that his father sits on with him and he collaborates with his father and the two of them look at one another and say, is this one good? What about that one? Is this one good? How many of you want him to say yes on your name? I want him to say, yes, he's good. Come, ye blessed of my father, and inherit the kingdom which was prepared for you from the foundations of the world. So Jesus being able to give eternal life 
has to be God. That's why Michael the archangel is not an angel. He is the title of the son of God before he became Mary's baby, commander of the heavenly hosts. Verse 3, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. There is no salvation in just knowing, and there is no salvation without knowing. The salvation is in knowing. To know is an act of intimacy. So intellectually knowing about God is not enough. You must know God internally, intimately, in order to have life eternal. Verse 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to what, church? To do. You see, when you don't do what God has assigned you to do, you don't glorify him. If you have a purpose in the church and you do not activate your purpose, you do not seek to be a blessing in the house of God, you sit in the pews from week to week and that's it, you are not glorifying God on the earth. In order to glorify God on the earth, you not only have to just start your work, you also have to do what? You have to finish it. Jesus finished his work. Verse 5, and now, Father, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self. This is another statement of divine equality with God. church. This was a glory that would be greater and more powerful than the power of death. It would be the glory of the creator. Jesus equated himself and his glory with the glory of his father. Why? Because Jesus is God with his father and with the Holy Ghost. Can you say amen? And Jesus would glorify his father on the cross. Jesus would hang there and he would make it through this great trial. And he would come forth on the third day early in the morning. I am the resurrection and the life. That's some glory. So he has thus far just prayed for himself. You see, when you pray to God, you start out by saluting God, creator of heaven and earth. Lord God, thank you. You are the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father. Talk to him. Introduce him to the conversation that you're having with him. Be respectful. Don't you be like some people talking about, yeah, man, me and God, we got a special relationship, you know. Uh, yeah, we cool. We down, man. He's my OG. <laughs> Don't you talk to God or about God like that. That's blasphemy. You are on no par with him.
I will deny you before the angels of heaven. Jesus then says in verse 6, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them to me. I'll continue to make repeated references to the fallacy that Michael the archangel is just a created being, an angel. He is not. Michael the angel is the second person of the Godhead, the incarnate Christ, before he became Mary's baby. He became incarnated into flesh. Michael the archangel is the commander of the heavenly host. Michael, the name means he who is like God. Don't you think Lucifer would have been upset about that name? Lucifer, the highest created angel. And yet there's another angel over here who says he who is like God. What? Huh? It's because he was God in the form of what the angels could not discern how he was different. And one day, because of confrontation with Lucifer in heaven, God had to tell the angels, he is my son. It's right there in scripture. That's not the sermon for today, but simply that there are people who belonged to God and that God gave them to him. I don't belong to an angel. Do you belong to an angel? No. We belong to God. And he says, and they have kept my word. Verse 7, now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. The disciples had been with Jesus for three and a half years. 1,260 days, figuratively speaking. 42 months, just like in prophecy. And the disciples, however, still had more to learn. You would think they would have learned enough in three and a half years, but they had now to go through life without Christ there in bodily form. He had given them the basics. And he said, upon this rock, he would build his church. What was the rock? Was the rock Peter? Everybody say no. The rock was the understanding of the disciples that he was the son of the living God, the Christ. They were to participate with Christ in the process. You know, when a, when a, when a contractor, general contractor, builds a house, He's the one who is the builder of the house, but he has some uh, laborers. Amen? And uh, I'm a laborer just like you. What do you say? And we're asking God that he would send more laborers into the harvest. Can you say amen? So that we can work together with brick and mortar and uh, building the church of God. Christ would build his church on this rock of a principle that he was the Christ. Verse 8, for I have given unto them words which thou gavest me and they have received them and have known surely that I came out from thee and they have believed that thou didst send me. Jesus may not be in front of you at your home when you're studying. You may not be walking around the earth following him wherever you go, wherever he goes. But his word is always there for you. John 15, he says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you will. It will be done unto you because when the word of God is in you, God is in you. Can you say amen? When the word of God inspired by the Holy Spirit, written on your heart by the Holy Spirit, is in you, the Holy Spirit takes care of that word. 
He's the curator of that word. How many of you know what a curator is? Someone who is a manager of an art gallery, and they go around making sure that there's no dust on things and that the moisture is right and the things that need to be protected behind um, either cages or uh, cupboards or glass enclosures. The curator is responsible for all of that. You can understand then that the Holy Spirit is the curator of the word of God in your heart. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. But today, today there is a counter word that's going on. There's a counterfeit force that is trying to countermand the things that God has given us. Satan is, listen to me church, Satan is using social media to destroy the word of God in you. Don't let him do it. Don't let him do it while you are here in the church. When you're on your cell phone, please let it be because you're following the scripture of John 17 that you're not looking at TikTok videos. Huh? Satan is using social media against the truth. Baal worship, spiritualism is on the rise. Witchcraft and anti-creation principles are being fed to you. Mind control instead of free will. Demon possession instead of divine impression. Sunday versus Sabbath. And anti-procreational pseudo-sex. That's not sex at all. We know that by beholding, you become changed into the likeness of what you see. And the more you know something, the more you know about something, the more you believe it. So if you know a lot about the devil, you want me to say that again? The more you do research and study into the devil and his ways, and you're not doing it under unction of the Holy Ghost, you're, you see, there, pastors have to study this. Preachers have to study this. Prophets have to read about this. And people who are teaching and evangelists, they're doing it for a particular reason. But if you are just being entertained, if you're looking into Lil Nas and The Weeknd and Kanye West and other things and the Kardashians and uh, uh, whatever else you want to say, if you're entertained and being, uh, looking after these celebrities, following their lives, the more you know about them, the more you become like them and believe in them. Haven't you heard it said? Seeing is believing. If you keep seeing celebrities, you begin to believe in them more than God. I just want to know what's going on. Wanting to know, to be impressed, is risking. Becoming possessed. Jesus says in verse 9, Father, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. It's pretty interesting. Jesus says he's not praying for the world. Isn't that something? But he's praying for you. Aren't you glad about it? Put your hands together for the fact that God is praying. Jesus is praying for you. Now, when he says he's not praying for the world, this is what Jesus is doing. Jesus' prayer is for the dedication of his servant. 
hearts. People of the world are not for his servants. This prayer is not for them. Does that make sense to you? He says, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Here's another divinity statement. Watch it. Verse 10. Jesus is claiming to be God. Here he says, all mine are thine, and all thine are mine. No created being could say, God, everything that everybody that belongs to you belongs to me. This is a statement of the divine nature of Christ. He is saying what belongs to God belongs to me. What God owns, I own. What glor whoever glorifies God glorifies me. And only God is to be glorified. Can you say amen? Amen. Verse 11. Now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father. Holy Father is a title for who? For God. Who else is it a holy? Who, who else is Holy Father a title for? Nobody. Only for God. For anyone to give the title Holy Father to another person, they're claiming that that person is God. This is a claim of divinity. To use this title is blasphemy. And to allow others to call you that is blasphemy. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Father and Son are one without division. There's a separation of powers for the purpose of hierarchy in the Godhead for creation and redemption, but they're all three one without disunity in spirit and in truth. That's the way God wants us to be as the body of Christ. It is an abomin denomination is abomination. Now, let me say this to you. You may have never heard this before. Seventh-day Adventist church movement, the remnant faith, is not a denomination of Christianity. It alone is Christianity. Why do I say that? Because the Bible identifies remnant Christianity in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, which says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, that's Christianity, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, that's last day Christianity. They who keep the commandments of God which includes the Sabbath. Can you say amen? So God's last day Christianity can only be the remnant that keeps the commandments of God, including the Sabbath, and is the faith of Jesus, i.e. Christian, and keeps and teaches the spirit of prophecy. That's the cor uh, correlated text cross-reference to Revelation 12, 17 is Revelation 19.10, which says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Because I ask people, if there's one God, how many religions would he make? Would he ever change his mind? No. Do we only have one religion claiming to be Christianity today? We have thousands. So did God change his mind? No, I am the Lord, I change not. Malachi 4. So who created these other religions that claim to be Christianity? Somebody other than God. Now there are some people who were participating in this process who did not realize what was happening and they were doing some good things. You see, the Baptist faith has brought good things into the Protestant movement of the last days. 
the Baptist faith. Baptism. Seventh-day Baptists are the ones who introduced the Sabbath to us as Adventists. The Methodists, they brought something. The uh, Pentecostals have brought something. The Anglicans, the Episcopalians, the uh, Church of God and the Church of Christ all have brought something that's relevant to the Protestant movement in the world. But God never designed that these different religions should go on their own path to their own journey. He designed that they should all come out of confusion. Babylon, the Catholic system that suppressed the truth of the word of God. And they were inspired to bring an element of truth to the movement, but to join together with everyone. As a result, you have today many Protestant faiths that really and truly have grown to become little Catholic churches, little Catholic religions. Why? It's because they're suppressing truth. They are binding themselves to a religious system and not to the word of God. So the last day remnant Christianity is the faith that is taking the gospel around the world, as Jesus said, this gospel of the kingdom, one gospel, not many gospels, one Jesus, not many different kinds of Jesuses, one gospel to the entire world. And there are only two worldwide religions associated with Christianity, the Catholic system and the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You only have two choices. But the remnant must be commandment-keeping, which means Sabbath-keeping, a Christian movement carrying the gospel around the world, teaching Bible prophecy. And Jesus says, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that scripture might be fulfilled. The son of perdition is another title for, it was for Judas, but it was a prophetic reference to the Antichrist, the man of sin, the wicked one, whom Paul calls the son of perdition in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 13, Jesus says, and now I come I to thee, these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word and the word, and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. If everybody loves you at work, something's wrong. If you're on the inside and the in crowd and you are uh, 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 tapping your feet at all the parties and you are, uh, the, the, you're the life of the group that's there, everybody likes you, they say, man, you should be a stand-up comedian because you got it going on. If something is wrong. We are not to be like the world. We are not to be of the world. The word and the world are at odds with one another. If you want the world, you can't have the word. If you want the word, you can't have the world. What do you want, church? I want the word. You got to choose. I pray not, verse 15, that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but thou shouldst keep them from the evil. This is a text which refutes the rapture theory, which says that God is not going to allow the church to go through the tribulation. He's going to rescue the church and take them away. But Jesus says here, I don't want you to take them out of the world. That's not what my prayer is about. My prayer is about giving them power. Who wants power in here? Just say amen. Amen. Verse 16, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. What church? Read, say it with me. Thy word is truth. Truth cleanses you. When you have the truth, it purifies you. When you know the truth, it refreshes you. 
when you see and understand the truth, it motivates you and empowers you. God's word is the truth. Read it. Study it. Go to bed with it. Get up with it. Re run after it. Chase it down. Be a God chaser, a truth chaser. Verse 18, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. God sent Jesus. Jesus sends me. Jesus sends you. Will you go? We must go together. As Christ was the Father's ambassador, and Jesus said, without the Father, I can do nothing. We're Christ's ambassadors, and without him, we can do nothing. Verse 19, and for their sake I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Truth sanctifies. This is something for each one of us. I want to stop for a moment. Jesus said, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Which means, as a man of God, I must sanctify myself in the truth of God's word so that people in my scope of influence will be blessed. And as blessing comes upon them, they too will be sanctified if they receive the blessing. Can you say amen? So this is not just something for me to do as a man of God. This is something for me to do as a husband. As I sanctify myself, I sanctify my wife. As I sanctify myself, I sanctify my children. As a pastor, as I sanctify myself, I sanctify the church. As a church member, as you sanctify yourself, you sanctify the pastor. We all sanctify each other. Verse 20, neither pray I for these alone but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. So now, where's Jesus? For the first verses 1 through 5, he prayed for himself. For verses 6 through 19, he prayed for his disciples. This is where the sermon title comes into play. Jesus is now praying for who? He's praying for me and for you. He said, Verse 20, John 17, the Lord's Prayer. Neither pray I for these alone, i.e. his disciples, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Who's that? That's me. That's you. That's us. That's the remnant. You see, let's go back to the beginning of sin. When Lucifer sinned, if God destroyed him the moment he sinned, if I'm Lucifer, Brother Mitchell is my best angel companion. He goes everywhere with me. One day I come up missing. Brother Mitchell, as an angel, goes to God and says, God, I've been all over heaven. I've looked everywhere. I can't find Lucifer. I've checked with all the worlds that we've been to. I didn't leave him behind. He hasn't gone back to do any further business. I don't know where he is. No one knows. If the angels had never seen evil, had they ever seen evil before? They had never seen evil before, had they? So if God said to Brother Mitchell as my angel friend, Lucifer doesn't exist anymore. His next question would not be, why? His question would be, what do you mean? God says he committed evil. Uh, what do you mean? He sinned. Lord, what is sin? He's dead now. I'm totally lost, God. You see, an infinite being cannot 
explain to a finite being an infinite concept. You cannot understand it. The only way for beings to, to understand evil would be to see it. So likewise, God cannot save humanity without humanity's participation. Are you with me? God cannot send all the angels of heaven to the earth. He cannot send the Holy Spirit to the earth and tell everybody everything that you need to know in order to understand evil in the plan of salvation. That would not fix it. God needs you and me in order to get rid of evil, just like he needed Lucifer's demonstration to reveal it to the angels. God needs our participation to get rid of sin. Scripture says, how can they hear except there be a preacher? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Paul says. The creator needs creatures to reveal what he can't reveal without him. God could only save the world by Jesus becoming human. Does that make the point for you? Christ can only reach the world, therefore, likewise, through us. But he can only do it if we become like the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they three are one. Jesus says in verse 21, after having said that he's praying for his disciples and for us who would believe, he says in verse 21, He's praying that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the, say it with me, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Let me come back to the point. Why is it that God can only claim one united global, religious faith as his own is because until he has that, the world will not know that he sent Jesus. Let me read it again. That they all may be one, verse 21 of John 17, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. Why? That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Until we become one, the world will not know that Jesus is Lord. As long as we are divided into Protestant, Christian faiths, Baptist, Methodist, Church of God, Church of God in Christ, it won't happen. And the non-denominational movement has made it even worse. Because every non-denominational church is its own denomination. Christ presents himself as equal to the Father. God is in Christ. Christ is in God. And they are both in us. As father and son are one, so must we be one with no division, no schism, no denomination. So what would the behavior be of God's one true faith? It would be a faith that is seeking to win, not just the drug addict prostitute, the gambler, the alcoholic, but also the Hindu, the Buddhist, the Shintoist, the Taoist, the Sheikist, Sikhist, I'm sorry, and also all people who claim to be Christian but are not keeping 
the truth of God's word. So if you see a religious system that is reaching out to all non-believers of what the truth is, they will be reaching out to them even if they claim already to be Christian. There are only three Christian-associated religions that have this behavior of trying to reach out to everyone to win them. Jehovah's Witnesses are claimed to be God's one true church, and they're reaching out to everybody, but they don't believe in Jesus as God. And that's what the gospel says. So they're, they're counted out. Mormons, they are trying to win everyone to them, but the problem with them is the mystical pagan principle that everybody can be Christ. We count that out. All you're left with is the Seventh-day Adventist faith, the last-day remnant movement that keeps the commandments of God, has the faith of Jesus, the testimony of Jesus Christ, carrying one gospel the world over in more countries in the world than any other true uh, Christian-claiming faith. So, if you agree that it's okay for Baptists to be Baptists and Presbyterians to be Presbyterians and Church of God in Christ to be Church of God in Christ, we're all serving the same God and we're all going to the same place, you already have counted yourself as being a part of God's one true faith. Do I need to say that again? Did you get it? If you're okay with denominations, if, and if you feel that your religion is okay with other denominations being a denomination, you have already canceled out yourself from being a part of God's one true faith. We must unite believers in unified belief, one faith, spirit, and truth. Verse 22, in the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them that they may be what, church? One even as we are one. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. The glory that the Father gave to Jesus, Jesus gives to us in the Comforter. Verse 23, I and them and thou and me that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that thou hast sent me. Jesus says it again, that if Christianity remains divided in its denominational form, which Jesus said, a house that is divided against itself shall not stand. It will fall. So if Scripture says Babylon is fallen, that means it used to not be fallen. Therefore, it was at one time right with God. Because God can't say Hinduism is not fallen. God can't say Islam is not fallen. God cannot say anything is not fallen if it's not the truth. Therefore, if he says something is fallen, that means it used to be the truth. Therefore, Babylon being fallen in the last days, Babylon meaning confusion, which means division, Christianity in its divided condition is modern-day spiritual Babylon. And Revelation 18, 1 through 4 says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and has become the cage of every unclean and hateful bird, and so on. It's God says, come out of Babylon, my people. If you tell somebody, come out of the bathroom, where are they? They're in the bathroom, right? You got a house full of nine people. Somebody's been in the bathroom too long. You say, hey, come on out of there. If you say, come out of the bathroom, they're in the bathroom. If God says, come out of Babylon, where are his people? In Babylon. So the one true remnant faith is saying, my Baptist brother, come out of Babylon. My Presbyterian brother, come out of Babylon. My Jehovah's Witness brother, come out of Babylon. Into God's one true faith. You see, denominations prevent the gospel because the gospel can only be advanced by one faith in Christ. Verse 24, as we close. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, 
The world hath not known thee, but I have known thee. And these have known that thou hast sent me. Because the disciples were one. They knew that Christ was sent by the Father because they were one. Having gotten Judas out of the way, the son of perdition, the eleven that were left were one. And I have declared unto them thy name, and I will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Love is the key, the centerpiece of the entire Bible, the most famous scripture the world over, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you want that life, won't you stand before your brothers and sisters around you, making your claim and staking your claim? I want eternal life. I want to be with Jesus forever. I don't want to be connected to this world. I want to be disconnected from it. I want to be one with Christ and one with the remnant movement so that I can participate and be a part of finishing this gospel work in all the world so that Jesus can come. Father, you see the people who are in your house of worship standing. staking their claim on eternal life. We're tired of this old world. We want what you have that is far better. Some of us may have nice houses, but they're nothing like the mansions that Jesus has prepared. Some of us may have fine clothes, but they're nothing like the long white robes that you have. Some of us are good at playing musical instruments, but there'll be nothing like strumming a harps of gold. Some can sing, some can't sing, but in that great day when we stand before you on your great white throne, we will all sing with rapturous praise the song of Moses and the Lamb and how we got over through the blood. Lord, we want to be there. I pray that you will encourage this church. Encourage every member that is here. Let them see that we're not just having church. We're not just on this street corner here having a Broadway show every week of dog and pony presentations. We're here trying to prepare people for the coming of Christ. He's soon to come. Let us take our thing, our hands off of the unsanctified things of the world. Let your truth sanctify. send laborers into the harvest. Young men who can strengthen the men of this church. Young women who can increase the beauty of this church. Young people who love you, who can be an encouragement to and friendship with Laura, uh, Kay, uh, Corey and Layla and Milani, and Michael, and Shari, and uh, others.
people can get to know you perfectly as youth. Send us preachers and teachers. Send us elders and deacons. Send us people of responsibility. Send us media technicians who have expertise to strengthen those who are working hard in the media booth. Send us people with economic powers and ideas and people with accounting skills to encourage the treasurer. Worship leaders to give Sister Musson a break. Lord, we need help. crying out to you. Bless our hospitality. Individuals who out of the goodness of their own hearts without being assigned are working hard to be a blessing to our church. spending time in the kitchen at home, praying over the things that they're doing to make sure that they're doing things right and to be uh, bring a spirit of love and fellowship into the church. Lord, we need to grow. We need to become stronger as a body. We have a message to teach, and we need more hands on deck. But what we do thank you for is what we already have. Thank you for those who are making the difference, who are keeping us strong. In the worthy and precious name of Jesus the Christ, we pray that everybody say, message you got. Amen. Amen. Pastor dropped some gems that I think I can build on later, so I take that as the moving of the spirit. So let's get ready to have our benediction and bless the Lord. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this blessed Sabbath day, Father. We thank you for the individuals here, the individuals who've made this day possible. Father, we ask for your blessing on this food. Let it be to our own bodies and people to further with your purpose, Father. Help us to practice temperance as we eat, Father. Help us to eat like a Christian would eat, Father. To set the example. Father, we thank you for all the hands on deck. Truly, the harvest is great and the laborers are few, Father. But we know that there are so many laborers that we have no knowledge of. that will be when we all see Jesus will sing and shout the victory we thank you all for coming to eternal life for those of you on zoom and YouTube God be with you we'll be here again every Sabbath day amen